Hello and welcome to today's tutorial where we will be ray marching fractals in geometry nodes. There will be a link to the blend file in the description, so check that out if you'd like. And let's get into it. Open Blender, select the cube, press Ctrl I to select everything else, X to delete, create a new window, set it as geometry nodes, and create a new node network. But hold on, what even is ray marching? Ray marching is a technique for rendering fractals and other distance based functions by marching along a series of rays that radiate from the position of a virtual camera through a set of points representing each pixel in the output image. Through a series of steps, we move each point along its corresponding ray direction until it reaches the quote-unquote surface of the distance function we are rendering. This surface is defined as each point in space where the distance function returns zero. We can improve this process by using the current distance of each point to the surface of the function to drive how far along its ray direction the point moves each step. Finding this value just involves feeding the current point position into the distance function, and this way we never overshoot the closest surface point in any given ray direction and can converge on the final image faster. Traditionally, ray marching is done in fragment shaders operating directly on pixels, but that won't stop us from doing it in Blender using geometry instead of pixels. Regardless, you should definitely check out shadertoy.com, which is an incredible learning resource for ray marching, shaders, and computer graphics in general. I know shader programming can be intimidating at first, but over time you will get the hang of it, and it will open up an entire world of possibilities. Now, without further ado, let's for real get into it. First, we'll create the geometry that will represent the pixels in our output image. We'll do this with a grid mesh primitive node and then pull in a value node to drive the size of the grid uh, in both the X and Y directions because we want it to be a square. And then also an integer input node to drive the resolution of our grid which will correspond to the number of pixels in our output image. I've got that set to zero for now, but we'll change that in just a second. Next, we'll lay down two transform geometry nodes and one object info node. We're gonna create a camera object that we're going to use with the object info node. So the second transform geometry node essentially moves the grid object so that it has the same translation and rotation of the camera so that it always moves with the camera and the first transform geometry node will just translate the grid object in the z direction before it is moved to copy the transformations of the camera and that's just so it's offset from the camera position just a little bit to actually see the grid and the transformations that we've just applied we're going to have to set the resolution to something higher than zero so we'll do that and here we'll offset the grid geometry a little bit from the actual origin of the camera by changing the z translation component of the first transform geometry node here let's just set up the camera to move with the view and now you can kind of see how the grid moves with the camera as you transform it around the scene Next, let's hop into the output settings and set the resolution to 1024 by 1024. And then use the Z offset of the grid from the camera to fit it nicely within the camera frame. Here we play with the resolution just to show what that looks like. And you can also use the size of the grid to fit it in the frame. That or the offset are both perfectly valid. You can do a lot of different things a lot of different ways. The next thing that we're going to want to do is store the ray direction as an attribute for each of the individual points. So use that store named attribute node set to vector and point. And then what we're going to do is we're going to get the difference vector between the position of the current point and the position of the camera. Um, and then we're going to normalize that vector so that the length of that vector is one and we can scale it to whatever we want later. Um, and then we're just gonna feed that into the store named attribute node. So again, it's the position of the current point minus the position of the camera object. You normalize that, store that in the ray direction attribute. For ray marching, we'll put down a simulation loop and perform one ray marching step inside. This is done by using the set position node to offset the position of each grid point by its ray direction attribute scaled according to the distance function. The distance function itself can be any function that takes a 3D vector as an input and returns a single value, also known as a scalar, as an output. 
One of the simplest distance functions describes a sphere. This works by taking the distance of the position from a point in space. Because we want the function to return zero on the surface of the sphere rather than the center of it, we'll also subtract a bit from the output of the distance node. If we position the camera so that it points at the sphere location and press play, we can see how the grid projects onto the surface of the sphere. We can make this distance function slightly more interesting by wrapping the position input between negative 0 0.5, negative 0 0.5, negative 0 0.5, and 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, so that the sphere repeats in space. The fractal distance function we'll use today has a couple more steps. Like most fractal functions, it requires an iterative loop, so let's put down a repeat zone. Similar to before, we'll lay down a wrap node to create a repeating or folding effect. This time we'll wrap between negative one, negative one, negative one, and one, one, one. This fractal works by iteratively applying a repetition and a spherical inversion. These next couple of nodes perform the inversion. We'll get the squared magnitude of the wrapped position vector through taking its dot product with itself. Then we'll divide the radius of the inversion sphere, which we are setting to be 1.333, by the squared magnitude. Then we'll scale both the wrapped position vector and a scale parameter by the output. It can be difficult to get a good intuition about what's going on here, but the gist is that we are starting with a bunch of points in space and iteratively applying these repetitions and spherical inversion transforms to each point a certain number of times. After these iterations, we check to see where the points end up in relation to some reference point or reference function. In this case, the value of the z position for each point. This z position value acts as the distance function output, and if it's close to zero, then the original point in space is close to the surface of the fractal. I learned about this fractal algorithm in a post on Shader Toy by Inigo Quillas. You can find a link in the description, so check that out to learn more. Here, we separate the position vector after the transformation iterations, take the absolute value of the z position, multiply this by 0.25, and then divide by the iterated scale parameter. These operations tune the points in space that correspond to the fractal surface. We can use the output of this distance function just like the simpler one we made before, and voila! a Raymarch fractal. One last tip for navigation is to replace the simulation loop with a repeat zone and set the resolution pretty low so you can interactively move the camera around and find an interesting angle before cranking up the resolution for the final render. Also, we can use a compare node to only perform ray marching on grid points whose distance to the surface of the fractal is greater than some small number, in this case, 0 0.0001. This prevents artifacts in the mesh that can occur if you leave the simulation running for a large number of frames. And that just about covers it. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial, I hope you learned something, and above all, I hope you had fun. Until next time.